Chapter 2 Oh, I shouldn't think there's anything to worry about, Rob. The voice at the other end of the telephone line sounded familiar but distant. Rob wished it could be closer at hand, that the unit beat constable could be right here with him now, making notes in a notebook, taking care of everything. They'll be in the house somewhere, the voice added, and Rob pictured the policeman, snug and safe across the bay, in the small cottage that was nine parts home and one part police station. But I've searched, said Rob into the telephone. Searched the whole house. There was no light in the telephone box, but Rob had managed to balance a hand torch on top of the empty directory rack. Oh, they're bound to be somewhere, said the voice that was too distant to be of any real reassurance. The wind was stronger down here near the shoreline. Shot with sea spray, it slashed against the dark windows of the telephone box. But, inside, the box seemed somehow airtight, stale with the smell of tobacco smoke and salt brine from the summer that had gone. "'Where are you phoning from, Rob?' The torch began to roll to the edge of the rack. Rob reached for it quickly with his free hand and held on to it tightly. The last thing he needed now was a broken torch and complete darkness. "'The phone box,' he said, "'down by the summer fishing chalets, near Dead Man's Point.' "'Oh!' and a silence at the other end of the phone. Rob could visualise the policeman, shoes off and feet up by an open fire, considering both his comfort and his duty. It seemed a long time before the voice spoke again. "'Tell you what, Rob?' "'Yes,' said Rob. "'You get on back to the house and look after your sister, right?' "'Yes, I will.' "'And I'll get Stan to ferry me over,' the voice went on. Be there in about an hour. Thank you, said Rob. Feeling relieved, almost cheerful, he replaced the phone receiver. It was almost a two-mile trek back to the house, along a dirt track approach road, the only approach road. Rob's father had chosen the house because of its isolation. He liked seclusion and preferred to know, as he would put it, when he was being invaded. His firm belief was that, between the time it took any visitor to first arrive on the approach road and then reach the house even by car, the inhabitants of the house could have made a cup of tea, a sandwich, and settled themselves down by a window to see just who the visitor was. Even at night, the noise of any object on the rough surface of the track road provided enough warning. With the wind behind him, Rob managed to run back part of the way. He jogged some, walked the rest. By the time he had reached the obsolete cattle grid in the road, another of Dad's early warning system aids, he could see the lights of the farmhouse. Rob opened the big front door and stepped into the hallway. He closed the door against the wind and the darkness, then locked and bolted it. He switched off the torch, removed his coat, then tried, without success, to make a quick job of smoothing down his wind-blown hair. He found Helen sitting where he had left her in the kitchen. She had not moved from the large fireside chair, and she still wore, over her nightdress, the blanket that he had wrapped around her before leaving the house. The glass of milk that he had poured for her remained untouched beside her. Rob had somehow hoped that his parents might have returned in his absence with an obvious reason for their disappearance. They might even have made a joke of it at his expense. But Helen's calm, questioning look told him that nothing had changed during his trip to the telephone at Dead Man's Point. "'Drink your milk, Helen,' he said, with an attempt at authority. The twelve-year-old taking care of the six-year-old taking charge of affairs now in what seemed an otherwise empty house. He did not feel that convincing, and Helen must have noticed this in her own small way, because she simply stared at him with the same calm but puzzled look on her face. "'Everything's all right,' he assured her. "'So just drink your milk.' It seemed to work. Although she neither smiled nor looked less troubled, she at least reached forward for her milk and began to sip it. Rob moved to the kitchen windows, 
drew back the curtains and looked out at the darkness. I've just been to make a telephone call, he informed her, drawing the curtains too once more. I've telephoned the policeman's cottage at Scar's Edge. Helen nodded over the rim of her glass. And I told Constable Daly there. You know Constable Daly, don't you? He asked the small face that was almost hidden by the glass of milk. Helen nodded yet again, and Rob wandered back to the centre of the room, as if it was the right and proper place to take command from. Well, he's coming out here, Rob announced. Constable Daly's coming here. Be here in no time. Helen lowered the glass from her face. Oh, she said, a white film of milk helping to form the shape of the word. Rob moved to her tugging a crumpled handkerchief from his pocket as he took the glass from her. So, so everything's all right then, isn't it? He said, wiping her mouth with the handkerchief. Helen gave yet another nod of the head. Yes, Rob. Rob put his arms about his sister to comfort her, then found that he was holding her very tightly, as if he too needed someone or even something to reassure him. The loud knocking at the front door came without any kind of warning. It was sure and precise. Four hard, sharp raps on the knocker, then quietness. Rob and Helen, both startled, looked up at once. Helen looked at her brother, expecting him to deal with the situation. There was a slight faltering of Rob's voice as he stood up and took command once more. "'Just stay here, Helen,' he said and walked towards the hallway door. As Rob entered the hallway from the kitchen, the front door knocker was banged loudly yet again. Four more sharp, precise knocks, identical in sound to the first four. Rob stayed put for a moment by the kitchen door. He looked along the hallway towards the front door. He estimated that probably a minute had passed between the first bout of knocking and the second and he imagined that, when a further minute had elapsed, exactly the same sound would happen again. Whoever was out there seemed to make the simple sound of a knock upon a door sound like a mathematical process. So Rob moved quickly to the door before the next minute was due to expire, but he made no attempt to open the door as yet. "'Who is it?' he said to the locked and bolted door. Robert Stephen Jardine. The man's voice from the other side of the door seemed as sharp and sure of itself as the punctuated knocking. Yes, answered Rob, surprised at hearing his full name spoken. The voice outside also sounded cool and flat and emotionless. You asked for help? I did, yes. Then unlock the door. Rob's first thought, as he drew back the first heavy bolt, was that Constable Daly had sent one of the Scars Edge villagers on ahead of him. His relief at hearing a voice, any voice, made him overlook the fact that he had heard no one approach the house. He drew the second bolt, unlatched the door, then opened it. The man and woman entered almost immediately. They hardly looked at Rob, Instead, they looked around them at the interior of the hallway as if they were carrying out some kind of inspection. Rob stared at them. The woman was the most beautiful person as he'd ever seen. She had long, fair hair, and she was wearing a dress that seemed to shimmer and shift and flow upon her slim figure. She turned to close the door, and, to Rob, it seemed as if there was an aura of blueness about her presence there in the dark hallway. In later years, whenever he remembered her, which was often, his first thought was always the colour blue. The man had moved to the foot of the first flight of stairs and was looking up at the landing above. He, too, had fair hair, but as the woman expressed blueness, so the man suggested the colour grey. His smart suit, shirt and tie were somehow neutral. His whole appearance and manner seemed cold, almost metallic. I... I don't know you, said Rob. 
The man had finished inspecting the first staircase. He had now moved along the hallway to the cellar door. The woman was setting the catch on the front door. She then proceeded to slide home the bolts. It was then, as the man opened the cellar door and stared down into the darkness below, that Rob suddenly realised that he had not heard either of them arrive at the house. Neither did they look as if they had been out in a strong wind. Their hair, like their clothes, was immaculate. She could have been at some expensive party, he at some important business meeting. Only the policeman at Scar's Edge, Rob began to explain. The policeman at Scar's Edge, declared the man without looking at Rob, isn't coming. He then closed the cellar door and looked past the puzzled Rob and along the hallway towards the kitchen. I've contacted him, the man said, told him that everything out here is now under control. But it isn't, Rob protested. I know, agreed the man. That's why we're here and not him. The man then walked down the hallway and into the kitchen. From the moment he had entered the house, the man had not looked at Rob once. Rob turned to the woman. She smiled at him. To Rob, the smile also radiated blueness. The blueness of a clear, bright sky. But a clear sky on a cool day, not a warm one and the smile was not the kind of smile that could be ignored. It set the rules. To an older youth, the smile could have seemed like a tease or a joke or a promise. He's a shade too serious, the woman said, indicating her companion. But you'll get used to him. But he's got no right to tell the policeman, Rob began to complain but the smile seemed to have complete control over any kind of protest. Your parents have disappeared, haven't they? Yes, said Rob, wondering how the woman knew this. And you want them back? Of course I want them back. Safely. And the smile had left the woman's face. In its place was a calm but penetrating look that somehow managed to ask the truth and tell the truth at one and the same time. Yes, said Rob quietly. Well then, she put out a hand and placed it upon Rob's shoulder. Your policeman, with his notebook and his questions, stands no chance in this world of getting them back for you. Then, before Rob could answer, she added, But we do. And she led him down the hallway towards the kitchen door. Rob looked up at her as they walked. Whatever it is that's happened to them, he began. The woman halted by the kitchen door and looked at Rob, waiting for him to finish what he had to say, as if that mattered, as he would always find with her, it was as if she knew exactly what he was going to say next anyway. My mother and father, he said. Whatever's happened to them, is it serious? The woman looked at him for a moment or two with her calm, discerning eyes. Yes, she said impassively, then led Rob through the open door and into the kitchen. <laughs>